My name's Sam. I'm the Partnerships and Communications Manager here at Ferrari Godboss, and Ferrari Godboss is the largest career community for women. Our mission is to improve the workplace by increasing transparency, and we offer a ton of great resources to do so, like anonymous company reviews, job listings, articles, virtual recruiting events, and so much more to help you succeed throughout your careers. So before we get started today, we will be taking questions at the end of this webinar. You can leave any and all questions you have in the Q&A, and you can leave them as yourself or anonymously. So if anything comes to mind, feel free to ask it. We'll get to as many as possible at the end. And we'll also be recording today's webinar and sending it out in a follow-up email that will go out either later today or tomorrow morning. Um, so be, stay on the lookout for that. If you miss anything, you need to hop off early, um, or you just want to share something with a friend, we will be sending you the link to do so. Here with me today is Dr. Heather Denniston. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so honored. Can you hear me okay, Samantha? Yeah, we can hear okay, you. It's over great. Oh, thank you. That Okay, then we're ready to go. Excellent. <laughs> thank you. Well, you guys just missed. I just about knocked my computer right off onto the floor, so I'm very glad that I didn't do that. Um, we are getting going. The title of the talk today is Bridging the Connection Between Wellness and Success. I found myself bawling in the shower at age 22. I was arthritic, inflamed, and about 70 pounds overweight. You see, when I was nine, I grew like a mastiff puppy, six inches in one year, which was tricky because mastiff puppies don't do back handsprings on the beam, and I was a competitive gymnast, so I quit. And instead, I focused on my other sport, competitive binge eating. By the time I hit college, I was 235 pounds, but it wasn't the weight. The weight was sign of a deeper issue issues, actually. Those issues were, I had no idea how to fuel my body, how to be functionally fit, how to be mindful, how to possess self-compassion. I realized if I was going to turn this titanic of health issues around, I was going to have to make the Mastiff Puppies Health my priority project. So I studied. I studied a lot. I became a chiropractor, a certified chiropractic wellness specialist, and a personal trainer. I was able to slowly turn that must of puppy's health around, and with 25 years of practice, I was also able to turn the health and wellness of thousands of patients and clients from not so good to more optimized. There are some foundational principles that I want to share with you today that will offer not only uh, an advancement in your own personal wellness, but have a direct effect on how you show up with the work you do in the world. Now, I think most of us want to be healthy. If it were that simple, we'd all be doing knee bends instead of binge watching Netflix. We'd all be eating kale instead of cupcakes. It's incredibly hard to know where to put your focus and energy and the onslaught of information you are bombarded with is distracting and overwhelming. So how do we silence that noise, the quick fixes, the miracle solutions, and how do we focus on the truth? Well, first thing we need to understand is wellness is a long game. It is a constant tinkering as your body evolves and changes. We need to keep learning, listening, and acting. And we need to understand something else. Unfortunately, there is no there there. We need to understand that we have to wake up every morning and recommit to, hey you, I am going to work as hard as I can for what is best for you, you incredible and powerful being. Once we get fit, we have to stay fit. Once we lose weight, we have to guard its return. Once we become mindful, it has to be nurtured. It feels sometimes a little bit discouraging. So why on earth do we do this? Why don't we just skip the gym and stare lovingly down the open end of a bag of chips. Well, I'm gonna tell you a story about Karen. Karen worked for Expedia. She was in an IT and she got a promotion. She'd been waiting for this for a long time. So she shared with her family that over the next couple of weeks, her hours were gonna ramp up and she was gonna be super busy. Well, those weeks turned into three months and 15 pounds. And the problem was is that Karen was already borderline diabetic. So when she visited her doctor, he said, Karen, you have two choices. 
You can dramatically change how you eat and how you exercise, or you can take a medication. And she thought about it and she decided, you know what, I'm so crazy busy at work right now. I'm gonna take the medication just temporarily. What she didn't realize is that the medication that she took for her borderline diabetes can also cause high blood pressure. So next she's on two medications. And then from sitting so much, she started to have some back pain and that back pain didn't go away. And soon it started to interrupt her sleep. She would wake up a little grumpy, a little irritable, and she'd show up to work with not the same attitude she used to. She started to isolate herself and her coworkers took kind of a wide berth around her cubicle. Her husband, Kevin, and her used to walk every night at six o'clock, but now her back was bothering her so much that she said, Kev, you go, I don't wanna interrupt your walking schedule, just go ahead. And Lucy, her daughter who plays volleyball on Tuesday and Thursday nights, she used to go to those games, but her back was bothering her, she couldn't sit in the bleachers, and frankly, she had a lot of work to do anyway. So here's what's happened. In six months total, up 15 pounds, two new medications, back pain, sleep disturbances, and a complete disconnect from her husband and her daughter because she's not spending the time with them that she used to. So that is kind of the slow, insidious, just choice by little choice that can take us down a road from optimized to poor health. Let me explain it just a slightly different way. I love this picture. Beautiful meadow, boys playing. It's just such a cool, moody photo. I just love it. I think it's so interesting. But what if we knew the photo was actually this? Full color, vibrant, completely alive. This is a little like our life. This is what we're supposed to be living. But a lot of times, slowly, little choice by little choice, our life heads here. And one of the saddest situations is when someone doesn't even know that this is still available to them. The richness of our life depends on the hundreds of daily health optimizing or depleting decisions we make. You may not realize that that glass of wine you had on Sunday impacts how you show up in the boardroom on Wednesday. How that missed orange theory class yesterday affects how you problem solve with your team today. I realize that wellness and all of those wellness choices affect the big players. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, of course they do but I am much more interested in how your wellness choices affect how you see this sunrise and whether you can actually get there to see it or not. I'm gonna share a diagram with you. I know it's complicated, take some time. These two circles and a line represent what I call the illness to wellness spectrum. And I use this on patients all the time because it's a great way to demonstrate our tension between those two. So in the illness, if you're inside the circle, you have symptoms. You got a cold, you got a flu, you got a sprained wrist, you have something telling you that something is not right with your health. Inside the wellness circle, this is optimized. You are, you are in phenomenal shape, you are as healthy as can be, you're clean eating, you're mindful, you are just firing on all cylinders. But there is a tightrope in between. And what about the person that's sitting right there? Are they healthy? No. Do you know that the first sign of heart disease often is a fatal heart attack? That's that person. A week ago, they had no signs or symptoms of heart disease because most of it flies under the radar, but they weren't fully well. So we have to walk this tightrope on a daily basis working toward our wellness. And here's the thing, it's not a vacuum. So we stand on this tightrope, we are actually facing a headwind as we point toward wellness. Because guess what? We're a living being. And when we are born, there's a certain time when we start to degenerate and change. 
Our DNA only lasts so long. Our joints only last so long. So we're actually working against a headwind. And that headwind, unfortunately, also relates to menopause. When you are reaching that area of menopause and your hormones start to change and all of that, I bet some of you can attest if you're there yet, that that starts to affect things as well. And so as we're standing on that line, we have to realize that we have to lean in. We have to focus a little bit more um, intentionally to get moving in that direction. And if you stand up and you're kind of like, oh, I'm just going to take a break. I'm good. There is no standing. You're going one direction or you're going the other direction. So if you're not paying attention and you're not conscientious of the health choices that you're making, it's not null, it's moving toward the decline. So I'm not saying this to discourage you. I'm saying this that as we go through today's information, I am going to give you three awesome foundational principles that are going to help put you in the driver's seat of your health and help make some of these things so much easier that maybe you've been trying to do and failing or maybe you just were too intimidated to try so come along with me the program i use is called the wellness amplifier method it's from 25 years of practice of working with patients and clients it's cumulative information that helped me turn my health around and the health of thousands of other people it goes into three pillars, activate, adapt, and ascend. But what we're talking about today are three foundational principles that I start with, with my either my corporate teams or my one-on-one -on -one people that I coach. I start with this very first. So you guys are getting some great foundation. So as I mentioned, I practice this on myself and I practice on, on the thousands of, of, of patients and clients that I've had, those poor unsuspecting buggers. So I am super excited to kind of share this with you. We're gonna start with the tenets of wellness. This is kind of like the preamble, the precursor, because if we don't get on the same page as far as what wellness is, then we may miss the boat. So let's all get on the same page and talk about what wellness is and what it isn't. Because what it isn't is a lack of symptoms. Wellness is not just not being sick or in pain, wellness is being optimized. So wellness is saving someone from the waves, not just looking good on the beach. Wellness is understanding that food is fuel, not friend. Understanding that your inner octogen octogenarian needs to have regular conversations with you about what she is going to need down the road and what you need to be doing right now to help secure that for her. Wellness is living in the moment. Wellness is honest and meaningful relationships. Wellness is honoring the rest your soul desires. So this looks a lot different than just meal planning and fitness classes, but it includes that as well. But we need to understand the bigger picture. So now that we're all on the same page, let's talk about those three principles that I promised you. First of all, we're going to talk about identifying our energy leakage liabilities. Second, we're gonna talk about discovering a deeply moving wellness why. Third, we're gonna curate a wellness pit crew of support. Okay, here we go. Energy leakage liabilities. Now, here's the thing. We are big balls of energy. And when we get up in the morning, that energy is at its peak. As we go through our day, there are certain behaviors that drain that energy. And we're gonna talk about what those are. And what we want to be careful of is where we're spilling energy that we don't need to. So for example, I divide energy leakage liabilities into two parts, brain drain and soul suck. Let's start with brain drain. Your brain operates like a cell phone battery, okay? When you wake up in the morning, you got full charge. You got all the bars. The end of the day, a lot of times we're down to one or two or none. I'll give you an example. If you wake up in the morning and you walk through your kitchen and there's a plate of brownies sitting on the kitchen counter, you grab your coffee and you walk right by it because you're like, eh, I don't need that right now. Nine o'clock at night after a glass of wine and your defenses are down, you're like, oh, I'm going to scarf that whole plate. 
This is why so many people have a hard time with night eating is because willpower is one of the biggest drains on yourself, on your brain battery. And so if you've been doing things all day, including willpower and some other things that we're going to talk about that drain your brain battery, then you're you're out of reserve. You don't have any left. You got no gas in the tank. And so it makes it harder to withstand and go, nope, I'm not going to have that or I'm not going to do that. And so that's an example of how that brain battery can affect you. So let's talk about brain battery drain type activities. First of all, decision making. There's a term or a phrase called decision fatigue, and it's very, very real. When we make decision after decision after decision after decision, it drains our brain of its energy and its glucose and its ability to engage in some of the other brain activities that are necessary for the day. So let me give you an example of something you might not think is a, is a brain drain. What do most of us do when we go to take a break? This is rapid fire decision making. So your brain is pretty good at telling you it needs a break. It's not good at telling you what to do for a break. So you have to figure that out. And flipping over your phone and liking, pinning, following, share, search, tag, that is just a whole bunch of decisions you don't need to be making that sucks at your brain energy. So that's an example of decision fatigue. There are a lot of high performers in the world that you and I both know who understand this concept. And here's an example. If you Google Mark Zuckerberg, this is the picture you'll get or some iteration of this picture because he wears a blue t-shirt or a blue long sleeve sweater to work every single day with jeans. He doesn't do that because he has no fashion sense. He does it because it's one less decision he needs to make during the day so that he can preserve his energy for the bigger problem solving things that he needs to do for his business. So decision fatigue is an area that we can look at for energy leakage. How can you streamline? How can you create efficiencies in your week? Multitasking. Ladies, I don't know about all you guys, but I find it common that women are like, I'm the best multitasker ever. Well, I'm sorry, multitasking doesn't actually exist. The brain can only focus on one thing at a time. How quickly you switch between the two is what you call multitasking. Now here's the issue. There is a cost of brain glucose when you go from one activity to another, and when you go from that activity back to the first one, it's costly. It's called context switching. So context switching, is the idea that when you're focusing on one task, you have 100% of your productivity. If you focus on two, we'd like to think we're doing 50 and 50, or maybe even better than that, because we're such great multitaskers, we've actually lost 20% of our productivity. Three, we've lost 40%, and it goes from there. And so this is as simple as you are working on a report your phone buzzes, you check an e uh, a text, and then as you check that text, you think, oh, I've got just a quick email thing I need to do. You've just lost, because you're doing three tasks, you've just lost 40% of your productivity. So that is another area that we just leak energy needlessly. Focus. Focus requires a ton of energy. This is an activity much better reserved for the first half of the day when your brain battery is full. Vigilance. This is an easy example. I'm sure many of you are moms or soon to be moms or you've got grown children. You know this as an example. Let's say you're walking through a mall. You got your latte, you're enjoying a Saturday afternoon just window shopping. Can you feel what that feels like? What does it feel like if you're window shopping, it's a Saturday, you have your laptop and your two and a half year old twins? That's a whole different set of energy, right? So vigilance, where you're focusing on someone or something, you're overseeing a team that you're overly concerned about, this is a place that we leak energy as well. And just being aware of it is the first step. Problem solving. That's the last one. Another task that is really great to do in the first half of your day, if possible. So we talked about brain drain. Let's talk about soul sucking. 
Worry. Has anything ever been accomplished by worrying about it? No, but we still do it. But it is important to be aware of that you're just spilling out energy as you worry about things that maybe you can't control or you can't control right now. Bad relationships. When I've given this talk before, I've often had people come up to me and say, as soon as you said bad relationship, I knew exactly the person that's not working in my life right now. And so evaluating, are there relationships that are just an energy drain for you? And it might be anything from a coworker to a close friend. Over extending yourself as a caretaker. We love to be caretakers. Some of us do it to the nth degree. The question that you wanna be asking yourself is this, are they actually asking for help? And do I have the capacity to give it? So that's something we wanna think about when we overextend ourselves, we're spending too much energy and we become empty. Lack of stillness. There's a great story about an ultra marathoner that went to live with a tribal group who something that sort of signified them or identified them is that they were a running tribe. They would run for days at a time and he wanted to use it as a training platform. So he went and he ran and he ran and he ran with them. And for the first few days, he would run, fall behind, and then he'd show up and they'd all be waiting for him. Run, fall behind, and he'd show up and they'd all be waiting for him. And so finally, he, he was able to communicate and said, I'm so sorry that you guys have to wait for me. And one of the guys, the tribesmen started laughing and said, we're not waiting for you. We're allowing our souls to catch up. I love that story. The imperativeness of stillness in our life is just more and more being documented. And as a productivity tool, actually, not as a waste of time, as many of us have thought for a long time. Overcommitting. I often talk about good versus should. So a lot of times our schedule is feel, filled with a lot of shoulds. Well, I should volunteer at the school, so I do. Well, I, I should go and help out X, Y, Z, so I do. And soon enough, you've got shoulds outweighing the goods on your schedule. And so and a task is flip open your calendar. Take a look at where there are you committing for something that's really good for you or something that you should be, or that, that you are kind of being shoulded by somebody else. Okay, so what are the solutions? We wanna talk practicality here. I wanna make sure that you leave with some really practical tools. So yoga meditation. Now I know probably one third of you is rolling your eyes right now because you're like, yes, Captain Obvious. But I wanna draw your attention to something. If either of these two words make you kind of just like, Egh. think about mindfulness, right? Mindfulness is very close to meditation. And mindfulness is a simple big deep breath in, breath out. Mindfulness is sticking some earbuds in and listening to a piece of classical music with your eyes closed and really focusing on the music. These are things that rebuild your battery, rebuild your energy. Breaks. I call them docking stations. So Jeff Weiner, Weiner, Weiner of LinkedIn, he schedules two hours worth of breaks every single day for 30 minute sessions. And you know what he was, does during that time? Nothing. Feet up on the desk, looks out the window, daydreams. He does that because he understands the power of docking stations during your day. It actually generates ideas, inspires creativity problem solves and helps you rejuvenate so that you can be way more present the rest of your day. Joy and passion, incredible energy restorers. I had a client, he was an executive, totally burnt out from his job. And we were looking for tactical ways to help him get through this without leaving his job. So we started to talk about the joy and passion piece. And I found out he's a piano player, used to play professionally, hasn't played in a long time. I said, do you still enjoy it? He said, I love it. And I said, okay, here's the thing. Commit to me for two weeks 
that you will do 15 minutes three times a day. And here's what you do. You leave your phone inside your home office. You walk out to the garage where your keyboard is. You have a time, a, a, just an analog timer deal. You set it for 15 and you play your heart out. And you do that three times during the day. He did not believe me, but he did it. And in two weeks, he could not believe he felt more productive. He connected with his family better at night and he kind of stopped hating his job. So joy and passion is an incredible way to also restore energy. Chatting, chatting with a close friend. Chatting with a close friend is much different than sitting down and chatting with a coworker or someone you don't know as well. Because whether you realize it or not, it takes a long time to drop the facade, drop the walls, drop who you think they want you to be and just completely feel like you can be yourself. And until you completely feel like you can be yourself, you're, you're using energy, you're not gaining it. And so chatting with a really trusted friend, close friend can help fuel you again, can help fill you up. Exercise, this is my, one of my favorites. We are perpetual motion machines. We are wired to move. The example I use is if you remember the crank flashlight and how you would turn it and it would light up, that's us. That is how our bodies are wired. And so when I work with clients that are, I'm too busy to work out, I'm too busy to work out, if I can tip them over and help them see that exercise is one of the best cognitive and physical things they can do for themselves. It's incredibly powerful. And uh, second to last, play. A lot of you are kind of like, huh? I did a class on play and it was very interesting to look around the room and see who actually couldn't remember what play meant to them. What's playful for you? Is it rolling around with kids on the floor? Is it dancing around your kitchen? Is it swinging on a swing? A lot of us have pushed it so far aside, we're in actual play debt. It's extremely important that we engage in playful activity, cognitively, longevity-wise, our, how our DNA um, extends. This is an incredibly important piece of our lives and we tend to deprioritize it because we're like, waste of time, it's not. And finally, grounding. Grounding is the concept of reconnecting with the earth in a way that allows us to absorb its wonderful negative electrons. And what happens is we are literally separated from the earth. Think about it. We wear shoes all the time. We walk on concrete. And so there sometimes are days uh, or weeks or months since you have actually touched something of nature or walked barefoot. So grounding yourself or at the very minimal walking in nature or just convening with nature is one of the biggest biohacks out there. So they've even done studies of desks facing green space versus desks not facing green space and seen an incredible connection between increased productivity, satisfaction at work, energy at the end of the day. And so even just plant on your desk or getting outside and just touching some plants as you're walking around is a great way to resorb and refuel yourself from an energetic standpoint. Okay, so we talked about energy leakage liabilities, a very essential piece. If we don't clean that up, it is very difficult to start to implement new practices and habits into your life. Second, a deeply moving wellness why. When I was in early practice, I used to work as a chiropractor I worked very closely with people's nutrition and their fitness as well and often patients would come in and they're like I'm not meeting my goals and I gave that up because I just couldn't make it work or whatever and I'd say let's say they had started running I'd say well why did you start running in the first place and inevitably their answer was well because I'm supposed to right I mean I, I'm told I have to exercise that's what everybody tells they did not have a deeply moving wellness why that motivated them to continue when times were tough, when implementing a new habit. So when we have a heart clenching, tear producing wellness why, it creates a framework for tons of incredible wellness 
um, decisions to be made. And so how do we find this wellness driver? Well, we go through a process of winding down. And you know who did that well? Jane. Jane did that well. Jane was an attendee at a offsite event I did for a corporation where I tasked the team with discovering their wellness why. And as I'm walking around the table, everybody's furatively writing on their pads of paper and Jane is sitting at the end of the table and she's just looking around and smiling. And so I go up to her and at the very top of her blank piece of paper are these three words, to be healthy. And so I said to Jane, uh, is that your wellness why? And she said, yeah. I said, okay, Jane, but why? Um, cause I guess I, I want to be active when I get older, but why? Cause, um, I want to have my independence, but why? Because, um, I, and she was just having a hard time and soon everybody's pens were down and all eyes were on us. And I just waited. Suddenly her face changed and she looked me dead in the eye and she said, because I don't ever want to tell my beautiful grandsons, sorry boys, Noni can't do that. <sighs> that wellness why is what gets Noni out of bed in the morning for her walks. You see, a deeply solid wellness why is the first domino in a cascade of fantastic wellness choices you can make, implement, and cr uh, create sustainability with. So I want you to right now, write down this link because I want to give you a Discovered Your Wellness Why free workbook. And I'm gonna hold you accountable. I want you to Instagram message me at wellfitandfed and tell me what your wellness why is. So the workbook takes about 15 to 30 minutes. I want you to turn around and say, here's my wellness why, it will be confidential but it's, it serves as an accountability measure to make sure you do this. Because if you do nothing else from this whole talk and you go through the wellness why process, I promise you your wellness strategy and aspirations will look very different. So it's bit.ly backslash capital W-E-L-L-W-H-Y, bit.ly backslash well why. Okay, let's talk about wellness pit crew. This is one of my favorites. Linda was a patient. I really enjoyed her a lot. She was very, very funny. And one day she came in and she did not look funny. She looked uh, sad and um, distracted. And I said, Linda, what's going on? And she said, Doc, I need you to help me with my lip. I said, your lip? I said, Linda, I'm a chiropractor. I'm not really too sure what you need help with. And she said, no, 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 my Linda improvement plan. I said, oh, well, I'm intrigued, tell me more. And she got very, very serious. And every time I tell this story, I get goosebumps because, uh, well, the first 20 times I told it, I cried. But I get, it, this was so poignant. She looks at me and she says, Doc, for the last 20 years, I've grown two boys and a career. And somewhere along the way, I lost myself. I look in the mirror and I don't recognize the reflection. I don't remember what I'm passionate about. I don't like the body I see. And I do not feel mindful in any way. She said, I need your help. I said, I would be happy to. So she and I came up with a process that we called the Wellness Pit Crew. And it was Linda's wellness pit crew. And we put together a team for her to support her in her wellness goals. So it was Reed, a physical therapist. It was Derek, a personal trainer. It was myself. And it was a gal from work who we're gonna talk about in a minute. But through that process, six months later, Linda had achieved some of the goals that she'd been trying for months and had not been able to stick to. And she was so much happier and was so grateful that she had found the resources and accountability that tipped the scales for her. One of the things that we had to talk about with Linda was true self-care and I, did, I didn't want to gloss over this. I thought about whether to include this or not, but I think it's too important. True self-care is not a pedicure. 
True self-care is the following. It's honoring the time you need to recover, be it from work or stress. It's investing in positive and fulfilling relationships. It's engaging in joyful and playful activity. It's fueling congruent with optimal function. It's saying no to obliga obligations that no longer serve you. It's consistently checking in with what you need. It's prioritizing daily movement. So that was a big piece of what we worked on with Linda was understanding what true self-care was. I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. But back to the pit crew. So I've been calling it a pit crew now for years when I teach patients how to curate the right resources and accountability. And I don't know about you guys, if you've seen Ford versus Ferrari, but I only just saw it like two weeks ago and I'm like, okay, this is great. I'm learning more about pit crews and I can use the analogy even more thoroughly now. And so even after the movie, I did some research and I looked at like, how do you train to be a pit crew? What are the different roles and responsibilities? And something I learned is that there's only five people over the, allowed over the wall to be a pit crew in many of the races. And I thought that's about right. Five is about the right amount of people to have on your team. And there's one guy who trains for the job, wait for it, holding a catch tray for gasoline drips underneath the hose. That's his whole job. But if he doesn't do it right, car could blow up. So it's very important, seemingly insignificant. And so I want you to think about as you're starting to kind of consider who's going to be on my wellness pit crew it does not have to be a big deal it could be some small thing that you ask somebody to do so back to linda's coworker, she didn't even know this woman very well but here's what helped linda reach her goals was her cube mate every monday up over the cube looks at linda linda did you hike on saturday that's it and that accountability, knowing that she was going to have to walk into work in the morning on Monday and tell her cube mate whether she did or did not hike was enough to get her butt out of bed on Saturdays to hike every single Saturday. So when you're thinking about your pit crew, you have some roles that will be more significant than others, but don't disregard tiny little tasks you could give some people in your life to help support you. So who's on these teams, you're obviously the driver. You might ask a doctor, massage therapist, a chiropractor, that's me, physical therapist, trainer, life coach, yoga instructor, psychologist, specialist, mentor, friend, coworker, special group. There's probably more, but this is a good sampling of to kind of get your brain thinking about if I'm going to embark on some new wellness goals, who do I need around me to help support me? Now you may have noticed I highlighted the word friend and I did that very intentionally. Your inner circle, your spouse or partner and your closest friends are not allowed to be on your wellness pit crew. And here's why. The people that are intertwined with your life the most deeply are the ones who, whether they know it or not, subconsciously, are attached to who you are right now, and they may struggle with who you want to become. I'm gonna say that again. The people who are closest to you are attached to who you are right now. They love you. And whether they realize it or not, may struggle a little bit with who you want to become. So, your wellness pit crew, good list here. Consider that. And finally, in regard to the pit crew, I want to talk some Brene Brown. So I was at a Brene Brown concert. I'll call it a concert because we sang folk songs at the end. The front half of the Brene Brown concert was a lecture. And she comes out on stage and about 10 minutes in, she starts putting up pictures behind her, five of them, big as life. And she said, this is my brain trust. Oprah, CEO of Pixar, Dalai Lama, and two others that I don't remember. And I'm like, dang girl, you are connected. And as soon as I thought that, she's like, oh, I don't know these people. I've never met them. 
but they are my messengers, my guides, my leaders. They are my gurus. They are who I go to if I have an issue or a problem or I want growth in an area. And I thought, ah, oh, this is the missing link of the pit crew. So when you are establishing your pit crew, I want you to reserve one space for somebody who can mentor you, who you probably will never meet, but who inspires you. And here's why I want you to do it. I'm studying self-compassion right now. And right now, self-compassion is one of the hottest topics out there. Christine Neff is, has been speaking on the subject for probably eight, nine, 10 years, and she is an expert. It's what she did her PhD in. She's phenomenally studied in self-compassion. So she is my, she is part of my pit crew because self-compassion is a piece of my wellness plan that I'm working on right now. And what that keeps me from doing is getting distracted by all the other people out there talking about self-compassion. Because if I get overly distracted and I go all sparkly, shiny object, I get nothing because I don't, I can't possibly dive deep enough into 10 different gurus as well as I can with one. So that's a part of your pit crew as well. Who's going to be your focus person? You might set it for three months or six months or the year that you have one or two maybe mentors that you can read their stuff. You can listen to their podcasts. You can watch their YouTubes and really dig into the work that they're putting out into the world. I'm going to start to wind us down with a story about Ernestine Shepard. Ernestine Shepard is an 83-year-old woman. She has won every fitness competition she's done in the last 10 years. And she started working out when she was 50. In fact, she had no intention of working out. Her sister dragged her to the gym. And shortly after they both started working out for a while, they jokingly said to each other, okay, if one of us goes first, the other has to pick up the torch and do twice as much. Not long after, Ernestine's sister died of cancer. Ernestine picked up that torch and she did exactly what she told her sister she would do. That is such a good illustration of a deeply moving wellness why. I can't think of a better one. She surrounded herself with an incredible team. I think it's her son-in-law who helps her run in the morning. She's got a couple of personal trainers she has somebody helping her with nutrition. She's got her wellness pit crew. And if you've heard Ernestine speak, you become very clear very quickly that she is linearly focused. She is going in a direction she is so clear about, and she does not allow things to distract her or steal her energy from her sole purpose. She is a great example of the three things that we talked about today. So, the richness of our life, again, depends on the hundreds of daily health optimizing or depleting decisions we make. Many of us do not know how to use wellness as a strategy to live, work, or play. That Mastiff puppy certainly didn't, but you can. By identifying where you're spilling your precious energy, by discovering a heart-centered wellness why, and by designing a specifically curated wellness pit crew, you have every opportunity to have explosive vibrancy, all that is available to you. And that will help you bridge the connection between your wellness and your success. That's it, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Heather. That was a really great presentation. I think we're all feeling very inspired right now. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of the incredible women that are part of Fairy God Boss. Yeah, so I want to let everybody know we are taking questions right now, so you can leave them in the Q&A or in the chat. I'll check both. Um, and again, we do have the option to leave questions anonymously. So if you don't want your name attached to it, but you still want to ask it, go right ahead, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, but I wanna start off with just one question that um, kind of came to mind is just, should a wellness why be redone every year or do I need to stick to the same one all the time? That's a great question. 
I have found in working with clients that it can tweak and change a little bit. Um, and so I, as part of an annual wellness planning event I do for myself and do for others, we revisit it and we go through the process again. So when you download the workbook, guys, put it in a file and earmark it as part of what you do at the beginning of the year, just to, to revisit. It might come out exactly the same. And I also wanna let people know, don't worry if it sounds um, generic because it's not generic to you. So a lot of what mine has to do is, is being able to live in a, a life full of adventure, choice and independence, um, free of anything limiting me. Well, that could apply to a lot of different people, but applies to me in a very specific way. And I know it's mine because it makes my heart tighten up and it gets me a little emotional. And I know I've landed on it when I've hit that. So just be aware of that when you're working on it. Um, I, we had a question come in that I really love because I relate to it a lot. Um, how can I ground myself when I live in a city and there's not much nature around? Oh, I love that. Yeah. So if you want to get really techy about it, there's actually some great things you can purchase for your home. There are grounding mats, uh, both which you can lie on and which you can put under your desk and put your feet on. And, um, and so if you just, uh, there is on YouTube an incredible grounding movie. It's one of the only kind of short movies that's on there about grounding. And he goes through a lot of the details of where to purchase these grounding mats, et cetera. Now, my recommendation is get yourself to a park as much as possible. Get your shoes off, walk in the grass, you know, have plants in your house that you can kind of touch their leaves and, and connect with them that way. Um, making sure that when you take vacations that you have the opportunity to be in nature, on the beach, walking barefoot, you know, whatever you can do to, to accelerate that when you do take vacations. But such a great question um, because a lot of us are in that situation. And so, you know, you can go all the way from purchasing a bunch of stuff to just heading to parks, hugging trees, touching grass, and doing it in any way that you can. I like the tip about bringing plants inside your house. I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm an active plant mom. Uh, so I always want to buy more and it's just, it's very relaxing, at least for me. I know for others, they kill their plants every day. So it's a little right. strange. But <laughs> and Sam, let me just say, you, that actually brought up such a good thing, community gardens. So a lot of cities have community gardens. You can stick the, your hands in the dirt mm -hmm. and, and get grounded. And maybe it's a volunteer thing you do, you know, twice a week or once a week and it allows you to get grounded. You get so much out of it. Awesome. Uh, so Laura just said, I was just talking to a friend about being a better plant mom. I want to bring green in. It's yeah. hard sometimes. It's hard. It you want to love your plants and they just don't want to love you. Uh, they don't want to love you back. <laughs> um, we had a question come in from Stephanie here. She says, what if you have trouble putting your pit put crew together? Yes. So I would start, uh, there, there's a couple different answers to that. I would definitely look at where are the deficits in your wellness. So let's say you've just had trouble losing weight and that's been the main thing. Then that's where I would start is to find some sort of support for nutrition, uh, whether it's a nutritionist or it's a health coach or it's a guru that you like to follow online who you really believe in their work. Um, that's a good place to start. And then just slowly add as you start to kind of get this under control, you can slowly add. Uh, I'm certainly available for anybody who wants to just get on and chat about pit crew. I'm happy to do that. Just contact me through Instagram uh, messenger and I'm happy to help you figure that out. Um, but I, I know it's tough, especially if uh, you're not really connected in your community, it's trickier, um, but it's definitely doable. Just take it one step at a time and remember those tiny rules that people can play like a coworker asking if you did your hike or whatever that might be. Um, just a quick question that came in. Uh, can you just say your Instagram uh, handle one more time? You bet. Sorry. Let's do this. There we go. So go. Um, Facebook, I'm well fit and fed across all three platforms. Um, I have a show that airs every Friday on YouTube that you can watch that's wellness information. And then Instagram is where I'm kind of most active as far as messenger goes. And then Facebook is where I host all my groups. So Great. Um, okay. Another question related to pit crews. Do yeah. I need to connect all of my, my pit crew people so that they're on the same page for my plan or can I keep them all separate? 
You can keep them all separate. I found it to be more effective to connect them. And it can be as simple as like a patient has said to me, hey, is it okay if I, if I link you to my physical therapist in an email string so we can just kind of stay connected about exercises and what they're having me work on and what you're having me work on. And most practitioners, if they're worth their weight, would be happy to collaborate. If you have one that's like, no, I don't have time, then you need to stop, start chopping around because most of us would be happy to create a, a situation for you that makes you more successful and so that's what I would recommend that if you can just a simple email connection or a group email uh, to your group and then that helps you stay accountable too because if you mess if you commit to messaging them once a week and just saying hey I'm going to just tell you guys how I'm doing as a source of accountability then it's great you've already got that email group string set up yeah that's great advice Another question here is, uh, how often should I be taking these breaks, these, you know, docking stations that you mentioned? Oh, yeah, that's a great question, too. Um, so there's different schools of thought. Uh, many believe that it should be 45 on, 15 off. Um, I would say a minimum of three good breaks a day is, is a starting point. And uh, for brain sort of cognition, et cetera, it needs to be a minimum of 10 minutes and it needs to be away from what you're doing. And so having a snack at your, at your desk isn't a true brain break. You need to get up and go somewhere else so your brain is looking at other things. And so that's really key. And just like Jeff Weiner, it's like, it's okay to just go sit out on a bench and stare off into space. In fact, that's recommended. Um, so don't feel like you have to be checking your phone or you, you know, get caught up on other things. You know, you just be, <laughs> you don't have to do. Um, okay, cool. An anonymous question um, just came through and this person wants to know, how can I not feel guilty about taking these breaks throughout the day, even though I'm trying to keep myself accountable, I still feel guilty. Uh, then I think it's a value proposition. And so it's, it's digging more into um, self-compassion, um, honoring yourself more. And so some of the work you might consider doing is looking at, at research and teachings in how we honor ourselves, how we value ourselves and how we um, put ourselves first in an unapologetic way so that we can be everything to the world that we have the opportunity to be. Because if we're in a deficit, we can't do the, the life work we're put on this planet to do. And so um, one thing you can do is also is when you like literally put them in your agenda as a I mean, you can call them whatever you want to call them. If other people are looking at your schedule and you want to call them something that isn't so obvious, hey, I'm going for a nap for 15 minutes, mm -hmm. um, just give it a different name, but keep it in there so people don't book over it. They don't question it. Um, it's just something you have in your schedule. And I think we're going to see more and more of that being very acceptable as we see the big players like Jeff Weiner and Mark Zuckerberg. And there's so many out there who are touting this as a, a way to get ahead uh, because it does does increase creativity, productivity, and all of the key metrics they're looking for. Yeah, I completely agree with you. It is, I definitely think, a trend that we are seeing in a lot yes. of companies kind of valuing their employees' just mental health and freedom to take the breaks when they need them in yeah. order to, like you said, be more creative. If they're getting business, better business results by allowing their employees to take more time for themselves, why wouldn't yes. they want to do it? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I totally agree. Great. Um, looks like we have one more question and then we'll wrap things up. Uh, do you have any resources for meditation? Oh, good. Uh, I have an excellent one. It's Ziva Meditation, Z-I-V-A. And the reason I'm recommending her is because I imagine many of you women watching are high performers. Um, you are busy working people. And Ziva Meditation, Emily Fletcher specifically designed her programs for high performers. So she works with um, some of the top names in, in corporate that you know you can imagine. And she works one-on-one -on -one with them. She works one-on -on group. And she's got some great stuff on her website that's downloadable free or downloadable, very affordable to get started. So that's one. And then Headspace app and Calm app are two of the other ones that I recommend all the time because they're so affordable and they're right there and they're really easy to use and they're excellent. So Ziva meditation for a little deeper dive, Headspace and Calm to get started. Perfect. 
Thank you so much for your presentation and your time today, Heather. This is a great, I think everybody learned a lot. Oh, good. I hope so. It's important to me to deliver a lot of practical information. So, um, you know, remember guys, you can watch this in replay, reach out to me anytime on Instagram messenger and just let me know your wellness why, or if you have any questions, I am here for you. We'll be including information about Heather's website as well as her free downloadable workbook in the email sent out either again later today or early tomorrow. We'll also be including a recording of this. So I know a few of you had to step out during it. You can watch it back at any time. Um, and thank you so much for spending your time with us today. We really appreciate it. And we'll catch you at the next one. Sam, Bye. thank you so much. Bye-bye.